Hello, my name is Adrian Goldberg and welcome to the Byline Times podcast. The Byline Times, it's what the papers don't say, what radio doesn't report and what telly doesn't tell you. This time, Angela Rayner and Mark Menzies and a tale of the tabloids. It should be emphasised right from the beginning that the people at the centre of the discussion on this podcast deny any wrongdoing. Rayner, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, is being investigated by Greater Manchester Police after an allegation that she illegally avoided capital gains tax from the sale of a house she owned in Stockport. If it had been her principal residence, as she claimed, then no tax would be due. But if, as her critics say, she was living elsewhere at the time with her then husband, she would have been due to pay 25% of the profits to HMRC. There would also be a question of whether she broke electoral law. Meanwhile, the filed MP, Mark Menzies, has had the Conservative whip withdrawn amid suggestions that he misused political donations to pay, quote, bad people, who he said were holding him hostage and, in a separate incident, to meet medical expenses. Do these stories tell us about the value of a free press or reveal bias and prejudice. Let's talk to Byline Times political editor Adam Bienkov and John McTurnan, Tony Blair's director of political operations at Downing Street between 2005 and 2007. John, welcome. Uh, Firstly, I just want to get your overall view of this, really. Two very different stories. Uh, It seems to me that the Mail newspapers in particular, the Daily Mail and the Mail on Sunday, have been very persistent, very dogged, in their desire to perhaps try and bring down Angela Rayner? Look, the difference between the two stories is clear. One is a smear. That's the attack on Angela Rayner, intended to silence her. She's one of Labour's greatest assets. And the other is a genuine scandal. It's reminiscent, really, of the of the last days of the John Major government, the years of sleaze, because there are so many stories. My jaw dropped about half a dozen times reading the Times exclusive on Mark Menzies. And we obviously await the result of the internal party investigations and the police investigations, if there are any. But what I note is that Conservative Central Office, CCHQ, have known about Mark Menzies and the allegations. The wrongdoing is is denied, but I don't think some of the details are actually being denied. They've known about these allegations for, for quite a long time. They've certainly known about them as long as the deputy chairman, James Dealey, and the chairman, Rick Holden, have been pursuing and agitating around Angela Rayner and, in the case of the deputy chairman, writing to pressurising Greater Manchester Police, saying that their dismissal of the issues was wrong, forcing them to re-examine, I think re-examine their decision rather than actually investigate Angela Rayner. So it's murky, connected, but one's a smear, a smear against Angela Rayner. She'll shrug it off, she's shrugging it off. And one is a scandal, which is likely to lead to yet another by-election in the Northwest and yet another drubbing for the Tory party. Adam, you've been doing some polling for the Byline Times, or at least been analysing some polling conducted for the Byline Times about the Angela Rayner situation. What does that tell us? Yeah, I think with all of these kind of allegations, I think sometimes the impact can be overstated by the press for the simple reason that the public's trust in politicians in general is is at such record lows that they just kind of generally chalk it up as being more of the same and they they switch off of these kinds of stories. I mean, there are exceptions, of course. You you look back to, I think Partygate is a good example of a scandal that really did cut through with the public and make a difference with voters because lockdown was such a traumatic experience for for so many people during that time. And and it felt like a betrayal to people quite on a personal level. I don't think the Rainer story is anything like that scale. I mean, for a start, it's quite hard to understand what it's really about. Uh, James Daly, the Conservative MP who made the complaint to Greater Manchester Police, spent this week taking part in quite bizarre media appearances in which he refused to say what he was actually accusing her of. It's not clear why he he didn't want to say what what his allegations were. And secondly, it's, it's very technical. So, you know, it's about should she have paid capital gains tax? Was it her primary or secondary uh, residence does her kitchen renovation cancel out the need for her paying capital gains tax uh, electoral rules uh, from a decade ago basically it sort of boils down to whether or not she did or didn't fill in a couple of forms correctly uh, a long time ago and i think when you get to that kind of level as an attack line it's it, it's not really the strongest line for the conservatives to be taking and this is what's come through in in the polling so we commissioned some polling from posters we think this week they found interesting that, that most people are at least aware of the allegations. So 65% of UK voters, it suggests, 
have heard something about them, although 35% haven't heard anything about them at all, which is quite a sizable amount. But when you ask whether they believe the allegations against Angela Rayner are fair or unfair, people are really quite split. 32% think that the stories are fair, 22% think they're unfair, but almost half in the polarity of voters, 46%, either aren't aware of the stories at all or don't know whether they're fair or unfair. So it's not something that seems to be capturing the public imagination in a large scale way, really. Which begs the question, I suppose, John, of why the Daily Mail and the Mail on Sunday are so keen to perpetuate it. I stress that this is being investigated by the police. Angela Rayner insists that she has not done anything wrong. Why are they so keen? Is it about getting any Labour target who they may feel they can kind of get some dirt on at whatever level? Or is it specifically, do you think, about the power of Angela Rayner to cut through, as Keir Starmer described her this week, as a working class woman? Look, I think it shows the influence of Malcolm X on the modern Tory party. Famously, <laughs> Brother Malcolm said, by any means necessary. And the Tories are so desperate, they will do anything to try to damage the Labour Party. And their big fear about Angela is really straightforward. She is the most charismatic politician in the House of Commons, bar none. Previously, you might have said it was a contest between her and Boris Johnson. Boris has left uh, the House of Commons. I can't think of a single person who rivals Angela. And it is that that they hate about her. It's not simply she's a working class woman. She's a working class woman with a sense of humour who can just brush them off, who cuts through to the public. And people get Angela's story. They get she was single mum. It's all relatable. Single mum. She was a care worker, a union official. She is in touch in so many ways. The Tory party used to produce people, MPs, ministers who had working class antecedents, who cut, who could cut through, who could communicate. They don't have any communicators left, so they want to damage Labour's most charismatic communicator. And we saw yesterday, what the, the, or the last couple of days, Labour's approach that has been exemplary, which is she was sitting, Angela Rayner was sitting at Sadiq Khan's manifesto launch. Angela got a message from Rachel Reeves through one of the official video channels of the Labour Party, where Labour was talking about housing and said about, about Angela Rayner, we'll have your back, we'll always have your back. And so, you know, there's a, a concerted attempt on the part of the Labour Party to unite in support of Angela. And interestingly, the Tories couldn't run fast enough to drop Mark Menzies as soon as the story came out. While they knew the story, while Rick Holden, the chair, and James Daly, the, the, the vice chair, the chair, knew the story, but it was only private, they didn't care. As soon as it came out, they dropped him uh, like a hot coal. Very interesting, your comparison with the end of the John Major era and talking about conservative sleaze. And there have been a, a number of MPs, haven't there? Not least, uh, not quite sleaze, but the, the whole party gate affair, which ultimately brought down Boris Johnson. But we've got people like Andrew Bridgen, who compared the side effects of COVID vaccines to the Holocaust, no longer a conservative MP. We've got Chris Pincher, who was forced to stand down in Tamworth. There is actually quite a, a substantial list of Conservative MPs who've been brought down either by sleaze or kind of woeful misjudgments. Yeah, look, I saw a calculation this week that the Tory majority had been 82 at the last general election, 2019, a landslide majority. It is now 34 because the number of suspensions, resignations, defeats in by-elections. And you could, go, you could go wider and further in terms of the sleeves, couldn't you? You could talk about their biggest single donor, Hester, who made those appalling racist remarks about Diane Abbott. You could talk about the extraordinary number uh, of donations from Russian-adjacent sources that have swirled through the Conservative Party's coffers. And indeed... The story of the filed MP has raised the lid on this form of donation that the the, the Tories have seem to have called lo local business forums, where business people can make donations which aren't transparent, which aren't declared, which give you a pool of cash from which it is alleged Menzies has taken money to pay for his own private medical expenses. It's very, very murky. And the thing is, when a government is visibly decaying and dying in terms of its support, you get these things, I'm granting, called the morbid symptoms. There's something going on which is that basically 
for the good of the party, Rishi Sunak, the Conservative Party, Rishi Sunak should call a, a general election because they need to be put out of their misery. Nobody I know in politics, nobody I suspect that Adam knows in the lobby, believes we have seen the last of the stories among Tory MPs. And we missed the other uh, recent one, of course, William Bragg, former <laughs> vice chairman of the 1922 backbench committee. He gave up the whip earlier this month, wasn't he? He was implicated in what was called a, a honey trap scandal. He passed on the numbers of other Conservative MPs because he feared a man that he'd met on a dating app would otherwise release compromising information about him. The obverse then of Angela Rayner's situation, Adam, all of these scandals, all of these incidents of sleaze. I was chatting to a friend of mine who was a, a local councillor in the West Midlands. And at the time when the newspapers were full of Boris Johnson's misdeeds and alleged misdeeds, he said it didn't really cut through and it didn't cut through until Partygate, until Boris Johnson was actually fined for having parties during lockdown and not obeying the same rules as everybody else. Do these incidents of Tory sleaze cut through? I think sometimes they can do. I mean, the problem is they're just such a huge volume of them. Some some of the ones that we've, we've missed off so far, there's there's one just yesterday, uh, Conservative donor Akil Tripathi, who funded Rishi Shunak's private jet travel, uh, he's had £14 million worth of his global assets frozen, according to the Financial Times, after being accused of fraud. We also had, just before Easter, we had Rishi Sunak, who quietly slipped out a new honours list, which included a knighthood for a billionaire, a former minister in the, in the Egyptian dictator, Hosni Mubarak's corrupt military dictatorship, who has documented ties to Russia. Also Conservative MP Philip Davies, who's blocked bills to tackle domestic violence, called for disabled people to be paid less than the minimum wage, suggested black people are more likely to be murderers. I mean, there's there's a whole series of these scandals. In fact, just today, Boris Johnson, a COBA, the UK's anti-corruption watchdog, found that he broke government rules by failing to declare his relationship with a hedge fund that organised his trip to meet the Venezuelan president. So I think that that kind of volume of scandal that is associated with the Conservative Party over recent years certainly dwarfs anything to do with Angela Rayner selling her council house a decade ago. Generally speaking, these kinds of scandals don't really have a huge impact on the public because, as I say, there is just this general lack of trust in politicians as a breed that public tend to switch off unless something really does cut through. Occasionally it does. It did with Partygate. I think it did with the expenses scandal many years ago. I don't think the Angela Rayner story is anything like on that scale. I don't think the stories we've seen this week about Conservative MPs that most people haven't really heard of are, are going to be anything like on that scale. But what it does do, I think, both for the Labour Party and for the Conservative Party, is it stops them talking about things that they want to be talking about. Rishi Sunak this week wanted to be talking about inflation coming down again. He's not been able to do that because he's still been answering questions about Mark Menzies and, and other matters. Labour as well want to be talking about cost of living and, and their plans for the country. And they've been derailed by all of these questions about Angela Rayner. So I think that's more of the impact it has rather than a kind of direct impact on voting intention. And when you look at the voting intention this week, according to Ipsos Mori, the longest running polling in the UK, the Conservatives reached their lowest ever level on that down to 19%. That suggests that this kind of overall sort of volume of negative stories about the Conservatives possibly is having a sort of minor impact. But the real cause of that collapsing isn't really to do with Conservative scandals, I would suggest. It's due to the fact that People's wages in real terms haven't really grown much in the last 14 years. People's mortgages massively spiked after List Truss's mini budget. And people feel like they need to take out second mortgages in order to pay for the weekly shop. So I think those factors are much more significant in, in what we're seeing at the moment in terms of the Labour Party's massive lead in the opinion polls rather than these kind of individual scandals. Yeah, John, obviously we want to blow our own trumpet here at the Byline Times. Obviously, we led the way with the PPE scandal. Adam did some fantastic work recently exposing that an alleged public protest against Angela Rayner was actually got up by a Conservative rival, a nonsense kind of imaginary protest, really. The Daily Mail and the Mail newspapers clearly have their own pro-Tory anti-Labour agenda. But in fairness to the papers, and, and 
if you like, traditional right-wing papers. It was the Times that broke the Menzies story, for example. So from your experience in Downing Street, if the papers are handed a juicy exclusive about a politician of any party, will they run it or will they sit on it or downplay it? Bear in mind the Telegraph did the MPs' expenses scandal as well. Well, look, I think the underlying reality is that the papers are in the sales business. They want to grab eyeballs. Increasingly, it's online as opposed to people buying physical copies of newspapers, but they're in a competition with each other. It's a very competitive media market in the UK, which is why if you get a scoop, you don't sit on it, you just go for it. Because if you found it, somebody else might find it. In terms of the the other dimension of it, it's very clear that the business context of newspapers, uh, the falling circulation, the competition for advertising revenue, which goes on not just with each other nowadays, but goes on with Google and Facebook, the online advertisers, which has led to the draining of resources for all newspapers and the reduction in paper for, for almost all journalists, those who have kept jobs and jobs have been cut massively too. In the context of dwindling revenues and the shift to online, There's a greater desire to do two things, in my view. One of them is to create a sense of outrage or anger, because really anger is the engine, the fuel uh, of the internet and social media. The other thing is you see the ability of papers like the Daily Mail to drive the political agenda because... What the mail says is always reported by the Radio 4 Today program in their papers review. It's not questioned, it's just reported, which means it then becomes, and you see this with the Angela Rayner story, the actual story at the moment is these questions won't go away, to which the obvious answer is, you blithering idiot, they will go away if you stop asking them. (laughs) Um, And the, the ability to actually put something on the front page again and again and again means it has to come back to the state program. It means Labour shadow ministers, because Adam's right, you know, this is getting in the way of people selling the message. Labour shadow ministers come on the radio or TV and they're asked a question to comment on this latest, this latest story. You know, and it, the difference between a smear and a scandal is in a scandal, you can easily imagine describing to somebody at a bus stop, in a cafe, at a school gate, in a pub, what's going on. I reckon most people in the country, if given the uh, Mark Menzies story, could tell it to people. And and it's got full of detail that you think is funny and also questionable. The Angela Rayner story, whenever I'm on uh, mainstream television or radio, I, I always ask the interviewer, what's actually the scandal? What is mm. it that Angela's being accused of? If you can't repeat the scandal, it's really hard to stick it to somebody because it's coming down to, oh, no, the questions won't go away. But never, what is the question? Because I I don't even think, to be honest, the Greater Manchester Police are investigating Angela Rayner. They're investigating allegations against her. And they're two very different things, actually, but they get blurred in the coverage. People have alleged things about her. And the reason why James Daly, who's made the allegations, won't repeat them in uh, in public is one one, one view. He he thinks they may be libelous or at the very best untrue. It's a humiliation, to be honest, for the Greater Manchester Police to devote 12 officers to be investigating on behalf of the HMRC, who actually are the relevant authority in enforcing capital gains tax, and on behalf of the, the local council, who are the relevant enforcement authority for the representation of the People's Act. And to be honest, if there's 12 spare coppers in Manchester to investigate Angela Rayner's papers, we could do them down in Peckham in South London. If you've got spare coppers, let's have them doing some coppering and tackling real crime. <laughs> Look, it's true. Talking to colleagues in the lobby about this, it's hard to find anybody who seriously believes that there is much to this story. As John suggests, it's hard to know what the allegations are. And even if the allegations are true, there's time limitations on all of the things that have been reported by the Mail. The reason it's been dragged out is because the Daily Mail has been putting it on their front page day after day after day. And as John says, the, the, or the BBC feels forced into making it a bigger story and, and to putting it on their own bulletins, bulletins and questioning Labour politicians about it. But I don't really believe that there's much chance of this story going much further. And looking at Labour politicians, it doesn't seem like they believe this story is going to go much further. I was at uh, Sadiq Khan's manifesto launch earlier this week, 
and Angela Rayner arrived almost hand in hand with Sadiq Khan. It was a, a huge standing ovation from Labour activists, councillors and MPs. She was embraced by Sadiq Khan, who sort of extended, in his words, love and solidarity to her. Keir Starmer and, and, and Rachel Reeves have both been very sort of strident in support of her. I don't believe that, that the Labour Party thinks that this is something that's ultimately going to go anywhere. But of course, it is draining a lot of time and a lot of resources from the issues that they really do want to be talking about at the moment. Yeah, and it just it carries echoes for me, John, of the attempts to prove, in inverted commas, that Keir Starmer had been up to party hijinks during the pandemic and an attempt to make some kind of legal charge stick against him, which failed, a kind of deflection tactic, really, because, of course, it was Boris Johnson and other ministers who were responsible for breaking the rules during lockdown. The beer gate or curry gate saga of allegations against uh, Keir Starmer it is very similar because it was the ability of the Daily Mail to keep putting the same story on the front page of their paper when they knew, one, because they've been told, that the Labour Party consulted NHS England and their interpretation of the rules, the Labour Party had consulted the local constabulary and their interpretation of the rules, and the Labour Party had taken advice from its own lawyers before the planning of the event. I mean, I remember one of the male writers saying, why is it that nobody who was involved working for the leader of the opposition's office at the time of this visit why is it that none of them work for the Labour Party anymore as if it was some kind of JFK style conspiracy and the people were being disappeared because they knew the truth and I think the thing is Labour learned then that if you know you've got a case that's sound you know the allegations are ridiculous you can power through them they are tedious and they are noise but you don't need to be bowled over by them. And the this constant demand that, that I hear, uh, I see on social media, I get it from mainstream journalists when I'm doing TV and radio, they say, well, shouldn't Angela Rayner just publish? Publish her advice, show us the facts, come clean. And the thing is, we can't have a world where politicians have to prove a negative, where you can make an accusation and then people have to prove it. And you can't have a world, surely, because this all of this is before Angela was an MP. We can't have a world where every single action that anybody who becomes an MP, that, that, that every action they made in their lives as an adult before they became an MP, they have to be open to public scrutiny about it. That way lies madness. Great to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining us, John. Been fascinating insight. Thank you as well to Byline Times political editor Adam Bienkoff. And if you want to support our work here on this podcast, please consider taking out a subscription to the Byline Times. It's a fantastic monthly newspaper featuring the best of our online offerings and content that you can't read anywhere else. Head over to bylinetimes.com for details of how to subscribe. This has been a We Bring Audio production made in Birmingham by me, Adrian Goldberg, for The Byline Times. We'll see you again soon. Cheers now. Bye-bye. <laughs>